Good morning, you guys. Well, thank you. Thanks for the prayers. I, I can't believe that we're here. I remember when we decided to do this trip on the Camino, it, you know, this was like September, right? And it was kind of a different world back then. I mean, I think it still continues to be a different world, but um, this trip thing seemed like the farthest thing, you know, and all of a sudden here we are. And uh, I think we are, I think the timing is just perfect, just right. I think God is so brilliant. Um, but I'm really looking forward to the time. Not time away from you guys, of course. You will be with me in my heart. And I just want to say, I, in my stead, I'm leaving behind somebody really good for you guys. So um, how many of you know Todd Pickett? All right, so, well, you know, all right, all right, all right. Todd was the guy, when I started here as a youth pastor forever ago, one of the guys in our preaching rota rotation, and every time Todd got to speak, I was like, yes, it's like my favorite. So you get three weeks of Todd Pickett, which he's a chaplain up at Biola, and um, just a wonderful guy who's going to talk about the heart, which is like, yes. So you're in for a treat. Three weeks with Todd, you're going to love it. So um, don't love it too much. Um, but anyway, it's the Sunday after Easter, which is always a little bit of a relief for me. I'm not going to lie. Like, Easter's a hard, it's a hard one. Um, and you would think, well, come on, this is like the culmination of everything. Shouldn't it just be filled with joy? Which, of course, it is. And yet, having to sort of facilitate some of that feels like a lot of expectation around the day. We're like getting right at the heart of this whole thing. Why we gather, what we, why we do what we do. And I love how Easter really is a season that begins on Easter and goes for 50 days. They call it Easter Tide. We enter into this time. But um, as much as I think we long for that sort of joy, sometimes it can be hard to live in that place of constant joy. In fact, after Easter, sometimes like right back to it, right, right back into the complexity of life. And what I love in the story of Scripture is that it just doesn't end with Jesus resurrecting. There's this sort of aftermath as people are kind of picking up the pieces and trying to figure out what is actually going on. Um, it reminds me, and this is going to be a rabbit trail into geekdom here, but has anybody read The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? Yeah, two of you. All right, three of you. <laughs> You're my people. Um, one of the things they do is they create this computer to solve the mystery of life, the universe, and everything. This, and it takes thousands of years for this computer to generate the answer, and they're all gathered. Say it. No, no, no. Tell me. 42. 42. So it spits out the answer, and it's 42. And they're like, what do we do with this, right? And then they realize they got the answer, but they don't know the question, right? Which, you know, then they have to make another computer. But um, in so many ways, this is kind of what happens in the gospel. That, that Jesus resurrects from the dead, and here they're looking at the answer, and they're going, what was the question? <laughs> right? Like, how, okay, how does this solve the whole thing? And what I love is the way that Jesus helps them get there helps walk them through this is what it means. And I thought, that's kind of what I want to do today in the aftermath of all of this and this big answer is to revisit the question, but really not so much the question as to look at how Jesus provides the answer, which is instead of going into some deep theological point, here's the atonement theory, he goes, here's the story. Here's the narrative and it's this story that helps us understand the answer. The way that Jesus does this, I find very endearing. It, um, it reminds me, so what comes to mind, bear with me here, but it reminds me of like something Bill Murray would do. <laughs> right, you know, and so, it, you know, if I had to go on record and say my favorite actor, this is, it's probably Bill. Well, for sure, for sure. That scene at the end where he, you can't hear what they're saying and you just hear that the very end, yeah, Bill and Scarlett out there talking and you don't hear the conversation. You're like, oh. 
but he captures like whimsy, but depth. He's kind of got the whole range. I, I love the Bill Murray scene in, um, what is the movie where, um, Moonrise Kingdom, where he comes out and he's just wearing like the plaid pants and he's got like a bottle of wine and an ax and, and he goes uh, to his kids, if you need me, I'm gonna be in the backyard looking for a tree to cut down. <laughs> and you're like, doesn't life feel like this sometimes? Um, but Bill Murray, what I, one thing that I love just about him is that he's, he's notorious for showing up. This is kind of like before cell phones. We just show up in New York, come up behind somebody, cover their eyes, say, guess who? They'd turn around, see Bill Murray, and he would say, no one's ever going to believe you. And he would walk away. <laughs> Just so awesome, right? And I think this is so what like Jesus kind of does here at the end. In fact, I was reading a there was an interview with him where the interviewer, I think it was in Rolling Stone or something like this, where he says, um, he goes, I have to know because I love this story and want it to be true. There have been stories about you sneaking up behind people in New York City, covering their eyes with their hands, saying, Guess who? And when they turn around, they see Bill Murray and, and hear the words, No one will ever believe you. And Bill says, I know, I know, I know, I know. I've heard about that from a lot of people, a lot of people. I don't know what to say. There's probably a really appropriate thing to say, something exactly and just perfectly right. But by God, it sounds crazy, doesn't it? Just so crazy and unlikely and unusual. <laughs> that's, his, that, that's his answer, right? Like, you just see him smiling, like, right? Doesn't that sound unbelievable? And you're like, oh, you do this. And... Anyway, all that build up to say, you know, like one of my favorite stories, and I thought we'd go back to this, this road to Emmaus, is, is Jesus just showing up with two of his people. People are running back to the tomb, trying to figure out what's going on. The tomb's empty, and what's Jesus doing? Well, he's on the road to Emmaus with two people that don't recognize him, and he just starts talking with them, asking them questions, and as he does, he starts piecing together what is really going on. If we back up just before the story in, verse, in chapter 24, verse 9, it talks about when they came back. This is the women. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 and to all the others. There's this gathering, these disciples hiding. These women come back. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles, but they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Yeah. Jesus is alive. The tomb is empty. They're like, nope. Um, Peter and John go running to see it for themselves. And two people leave, we find out. These two people on the road to Emmaus that don't stick around to wait for confirmation. They just leave. Which... Um, I think I relate to that too. This is called like an Irish goodbye. Have you heard of this term? This is where like in that party where everybody's kind of that like little lull and they're like, you want to go, right? And these two people leave, going, walking home, leaving in discouragement, still caught up in this moment. Do we believe this? It sounds like nonsense. And so in, in verse 13, as the story goes on, it says that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And you have all this sadness, maybe even despair, that they had this hope we had hoped that's lost, right? And in this moment of despair caused by this confusion, they don't understand what all of this means because they thought that this was going to be the liberator and you see, their story was that Jesus was going to conquer. He was going to come. He was going to take over. Hadn't he been talking all along about a kingdom, a kingdom that he was setting up, and now their king had come, and now their king was dead. And what about all of this conquering? 
I love how on this road they're like working it out. This is, Patty and I have been, you know, doing walks in preparation for the Camino, and, and this is what we do as we walk, is work it out, at least for a couple hours, and then we're exhausted, and the last hour we don't say anything. But um, <laughs> they're in there trying to figure out what in the world it all means. They have these women come back, but they're hysterical. It sounds like nonsense, but their hopes are broken. And they're coming in with their story, trying to make it fit with the data. And isn't this what we do? All of us have like a, a story, our story that we tell ourselves. And in this story, some of it is like who we want to be when we grow up or what are the things that we're here to do? We've got a 17-year-old that's about to graduate and you think this is like the launch of their story, right? All of them are asking these questions. What am I here to do? What is life about? And here, this interruption in all of this is of where they thought this story was going. In many ways, this is the thing, I think, for them that had to be disappointed in order for them to see that their story of the way the world works had to get disrupted. And I tell you this because I think it's not just true for them. I think it's true for all of us. As we come and talk about what life is all about and what matters the most, when Jesus says, I've come to give you life and give it abundant, you're like, what's according to what story? And each of us has a little different one. And what we find out, and this is what I love about what Scripture gives us, is that there is a story that encapsulates all of our stories. Without this, our story is just left to, hey, whatever works for you, right? And we live in a world that feels kind of comfortable with that. Like, hey, yeah, that's your story, and this is my story, and we each have our own story. But Jesus is going to tell them the story from beginning to end, the story that all of our stories fit into. And fitting into that story helps us make sense out of what we are here to do, makes sense out of what Jesus came to do. It shows how this is the answer that we're looking for. So in verse 19, continuing on, it says, he said to them, what things? <laughs> Which I like, right? I mean, he could have just jumped ahead, but there's something important in this process, right? This is, I, I joke that it's Bill Murray, but, but this is a, the most brilliant teacher that ever lived helping them unwind their disappointments and see. So he says to them, what things? And they said to him concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And there's this moment, right? And, and again, when he says, oh, you know, these, uh, this idea of, you know, the foolish and slow to believe, um, these are for Jesus' terms of affection for them, right? He says this with a smile on his face, not with a, a rebuke as much as like, no, you guys can get this, right? And, and he says, and I love this, he says, this was necessary. What might feel to them arbitrary, like the cross? Like, where, why that? And he's going, no, 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 this is the way it had to be. And as he gives them context, he goes all the way back to the origins all the way back to where it started. Why do we have a dying Messiah who resurrects instead of just a conquering one who comes in and dominates, right? Isn't that the better story? And Jesus goes all the way back and starts explaining to them, this is, this is the deal, like this idea of a, a created world with intentionality. 
I think so often we live in a world where people tend to like sort of revel in the randomness of things. I, um, I've told you this before, but one of my favorite physicists, he'll say with this sort of wonder and awe, this is what happens when helium atoms are given 13.8 billion years to cook. <laughs> Brian Cox. And um, he says it with such reverie, right? This is his narrative, right? That all this is randomness, all of this is chance. But aren't these beautiful things that come out of it wonderful to appreciate? And this is, Jesus is saying, okay, no, okay, that's not, that's not the story, right, Brian? He's brilliant in his, like, in his lane, right? But, but when he starts speaking this way, telling the story, we see Jesus going, no, 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 it was made with design, made with intentionality, declared good, disrupted by man's freedom, that a disease enters in that needed to be cured and set free. And the plan to, to rescue this world begins with a man, Abraham. God comes to him and says, it's from you that the rescue is going to occur. And Abraham, God tells him, you are, you're chosen. Like, I'm giving you this assignment. In this assignment, you are going to be the people of blessing and then he defines this because this is important. The, the disease wants to take that narrative and go, good, the people of blessing, that means I get it all, right? And God goes, no, no, no. The way blessing really works is it will come through you. That you are the people that are going to bless the world. That's what it means to be chosen. Jewish, right? Yes. Yeah, Makes a covenant, right? Makes a covenant with Abraham. I love how even when he does it, he goes, this is a covenant. They're, they're set up to make this together. They're going to walk through this path. And then God like puts Abraham to sleep and walks through it himself. And he says, I'm going to do this. To understand this story, we have to understand, N.T. writes the one who says, you have to understand it in terms of creation and covenant. And God comes in in these promises with his people, says, I will do this comes to Moses and he says, there's an order. Here's an identity. He restores these people, liberates them from Egypt, from the oppression, uses that as an undercurrent of a narrative for this Jewish people. That God comes in and sets them free. He gives them a way to atone for their sacrifices, but it's a sort of temporary ongoing thing until finally the final sacrifice will come. The one who fixes this brokenness here once and for all. And in this moment, you know, that he's helping them to, to pull out of their too small story and give them eyes to see what is greater. We're going to see in our text as they go, their hearts are like starting to burn as he's telling them this. I, I love this quote from Frederick Beekner. He says, their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And I think those eyes are almost the most haunting part of the whole haunting story because they remind me so much of my own eyes because I suspect they remind you also of yours. How extraordinary to have eyes like that, eyes that look out at this world we live in, but more often than not see everything except what matters most. It's getting them to turn aside to see this greater arc, which is hard for us. You know, I love how like that verse in Jeremiah where God says, I have plans to prosper you and not to harm you. And we go, oh, I love that verse, right? Don't we love that verse? But, but the verse is preceding it. He's saying in 70 years. <laughs> in other words, not you, right? But you, right? And this, this story it ends well. This story that we see that God has been telling from beginning all the way to the end. And as he tells this larger story, he, he then starts to dip back into, um, into the prophets. And, and as he does this, he, he starts to say, look, this all along was the way it was foretold. That God was going to come, but in a way that we were going to have trouble recognizing. Why? Well, first, it, it happens on a scale that's too little for us, right? In Micah 5.2, it 
The prophet says, but you, O Bethlehem, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from of old, from ancient days. And this is Jesus again showing us the nature, not only of this story, but of the kingdom that all the things that we look for, we're looking for big cities and like a big to-do, and, and Jesus goes, no, it comes small. And it comes humble, explaining to them, you know, you could see in this, like Jesus is like, didn't you see me ride in on a donkey? Well, they don't know it's him yet, but the, what about the donkey? What did that mean? You know, and taking us back to Zechariah 9.9, rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you righteous. And having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So it comes small, it comes humble, it comes in peace, it comes as a child that enters into this world. Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. I'm just guessing that these might be some of the places Jesus went, right? Um, we have to speculate. I wish I had his notes. <laughs> be so much more helpful, right? But someday that'll probably be available. But um, for to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace, there will be no end on the throne of David over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice, with righteousness, from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this, is doing this, has been doing this, bringing this people to this point of time at this moment to bring the final once and for all sacrifice. And they know that there's a promise, a promise of a king on a throne that God had said to David, one of his covenants, it's going to come through you, a, a king that will sit on the throne forever. And those of you that have been with Greg and his Isaiah study know that, that in the end you have these servant songs at the end, this culmination, but, but it's like the king has come, and then what? The answer comes and then, Isaiah 53, the brokenness is the way. Surely he's borne our, gift, our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet he, we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That peace, right? This is where their story just comes falling apart because none of us want that story, do we? We're like, I want the trajectory of success. I, don't, I, I want just this like uneven, how do I avoid sorrow? How do I avoid discomfort? Most of our stories have these prosper and not to harm sort of themes to them, which again is we see the ultimate answer to the story. But the way of Jesus, the way he models, the way that we are called to go looks more like this. Sacrifice as a way of demonstrating love. I think sometimes we go, ooh, okay, like, is there another plan? Which, I mean, we see even modeled by Jesus as he gets to that point as he's sitting there in the garden and he's saying to the Father, is there another plan? And the Father is saying, this is the way, as Jesus says, the necessary way. The way where God can communicate his heart to us of who he really is. The way that he can make a way back. This is the answer. This is the, the piece of the story that they had been missing all along. I love how C.S. Lewis says, this is the missing piece of the symphony. Like, we've had all the pages, but there's this big hole in the symphony. What, and then all of a sudden we find these pages. He goes, how do you know that this is the missing piece? It pulls the whole thing together. I was listening to somebody recently saying, this, this is why when you think about some of these other gospels that were written, 
aren't in our canon. And they, they go, well, these gospels tend to just simply be good advice, esoteric knowledge. And what they fail to do is tie in to the story. And what we find in each of our gospels is these tie-ins. I, I love how Mark starts his gospel by going, this is the beginning of the gospel. I'm going to tell you the story. And oh, by the way, it starts with this moment that Isaiah predicted way back here about John the Baptist, right? They tell the whole story. And for us to understand our life in light of this context, we realize this is our story as well. In Luke 24, it says, they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them, and when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him. And he said, no one will ever believe you. <laughs> and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. I love this picture. I love the sort of tangible moment of Jesus breaking this bread. We realize that in this symbol is, is the mystery. It's the missing piece of the symphony. It's in the breaking of these elements. The part of the story that we kind of want to fast forward through to get to the good part is this necessary part of our too small story ending so that God can then tell us our true story the story that we are to follow in his steps, that we are to take up our cross. Like Jesus said, it's a narrow road if you take it. Why? Because it's hard. And I think about this when God comes, because I think that God does, we have our own sort of Emmaus Road moments in this life, at least if we're open God says, like Jesus here is saying, I've got somewhere to go. And they're like, please come in. And, and see, even there, I think that's so like Jesus. Then in our own life, we're like, well, I don't know if I've ever seen God. And you kind of go, well, have you ever invited him? <laughs> right? That we have this, this God who doesn't, as Lewis would say, doesn't ravish, only woos. And the promise again and again, especially by the prophets, is if you seek, you will find, right? And you, and you see the, the sort of initiation piece on our end is, is, do we want this? Jesus always did, even for the people that are sitting there requiring healing, he says, what would you ask of me, right? And they're like, to walk, duh, <laughs> right? But he's asking for something more, like from the heart, and I think the truth is a lot of times we in our story just want to be left alone. My, my mom just told me a story of one of my nephews who's a tiny little guy, you know, and um, she's talking to him about heaven and saying, what do you think heaven's going to be like? And he said, oh, like unending screen time. <laughs> and I was like, that's the other place. I just, want to, I just want to come into this like small little world and be undisturbed forever, right? And yeah, amen. God is saying like, look, I'm here to give you life. I'm here to break you open and make you free. To set you free from that thing inside of you that is broken and hurting, that, that carries you back into that too small story, the one that you clutch to your power, you clutch to your security, you clutch to your control. And don't we do this still? And we're looking for a gospel every time we thumb through the news, right? What's the good news? What's the good news? 
that maybe our candidate's winning, right? Or, or maybe it's just a time of economic prosperity, and so all, we found the cure to something. We're looking for some good news, but generally in light of this small story. And Jesus comes and he brings us good news, not good advice. He does give us good advice at times, but that's not the gospel. The gospel is good news. And Jesus comes right into the midst of our story and reveals the whole thing, puts it in light of a much greater context. Jesus comes in as the new Adam, the beginning of this new creation. Some of the most beautiful verses that Paul ever wrote in Romans chapter 8, he says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing with the re- revealing of the sons of God, for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, and hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And we're still groaning every time we look outside on a little larger scale at a world that continues to groan, where suffering is still going on. And I think we probably, like the disciples, are like, Can, you know, are we done? I love how Jesus goes up to the Mount of Transfiguration, and they're like, what next? And he's like, I'm leaving, <laughs> but you guys are staying, right? Your story's not done, and this is the beginning. You guys go now and be light. You guys go and be salt. You guys go and be the ones to reveal the greater story to the world around you. Jesus walks on our road with us. Jesus stirs our hearts so that it burns. And then Jesus says, give, you break the bread and give it to others. Hebrews 10, 11 through 18 says, Every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which never can take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he is perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And this road of sanctification, this is the road that we walk. I think the, the gift, like thinking about walking the Camino, right? We, that this moment of conversion, as Chesterton would say, is not the end of your education, it's the beginning of your education. That as you follow this road, follow Christ, you are becoming like Christ. That this one-time thing ends up becoming the thing that pushes us into our story that empowers us to lead our story. In fact, we're going to see as the story goes on that his spirit comes in and indwells us to give us the grace and the strength. That this sacrificial love of God has not disappeared, but it's come now all the way into our hearts. That God comes in in that place of intimacy. And this is what we talked about all through 1 John, right? He comes in, the agape love affirms to us that we are the beloved and then says, love others, to show them this greater story. And like I said, they all wanted a conqueror. They all wanted somebody who was going to help their side win, their team win, right? And one of the things that Jesus reveals is like, no, 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 there's no team. Like, those are all my kids. Go get them. Go get my sheep and pull them in. And for us, this is what we take part in. We are more than conquerors, as Paul says. He says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. 
How does he know that? He knows that because of the resurrection. But what they saw in Good Friday was the love of God poured out. What they saw on Easter morning was the fulfillment of the covenant. God had walked through that himself and done it once and for all for us. But our story now just begins. We are like the team on the field right now. I think one of the greatest gifts of being the church is the fact that we don't have to do this on our own. We don't isolate. We actually come and collaborate together on doing this. It's one of the greatest joys, I think, from yesterday for Patty was coming home, and I was like, how was the retreat? And she's like, oh my gosh, all the different things that were shared, all the different ways that all these stories overlapped in the women in our church to like help renew and sustain. This is what the church does. And God's equipped each one of us to come alongside like we need each other so much in this. But how important for us as a church to realize that this story, that one of the greatest gifts of joy is we get to go there together. We deeply need each other, which means we need each one of us to be stepping more and more into our story, not the small story, not the comfortable story, the one that leads with sacrificial love, the one that considers others more important than himself. And that that love shines through a character that is, like Jesus described, meek, a peacemaker, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. The blessing comes out of this sort of heart. And thinking about this, where do we go from here? I love that Todd is going to be talking about the heart because this is where Jesus wants to take us further and further into that heart to set that heart more and more free, to empower it so that it shines brighter and brighter, and that when others see it, they don't praise our good works and praise us. They see that light and praise our Father in heaven. Three questions for you as we draw this to a close. Question one, where is God trying to get your attention? (laughs) Everywhere. Where might you invite him in? And to think about that, this this God around us, most of the time whispering to us, waiting for us to invite him in. Number two, what circumstances in your life have you feeling discouraged or hopeless? How might God be using these things to teach you more who you are, who he is, and what you're really here for? that God in those disappointments so often breaks the things we're clutching to so desperately to allow us to open our hands and respond with humility. And number three, how is the gospel being revealed in your life? What are some ways that your life might shine the hope of the gospel to others? Not good advice that we go around lecturing people with, but good news. It's finished done. He's alive and he's risen. How do our lives speak that hope to others so that they would ask? And then how do we respond, as Peter would say, with gentleness and respect? Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you. Thank you for this story. Thank you for this piece of the story that pulls the whole thing together. Thank you for your courage in your love. God, help us to lead lives of both courage and love. Help us to follow that road of humility that our eyes would be drawn to see your work in others, that we would move toward the margins, towards those in need. God, fill our hearts with hope so that we can be hope to this world. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. You guys, I'm going to miss you. (laughs) A little bit. (laughs) But, um, you know, if you would like prayer this morning, we'll be down front to pray. Um, As you go, I just leave you with a blessing that God would bless you and keep you, that he would make his face shine on you and be gracious to you, that he would lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Love you guys. God bless you.